I'm going to turn on this recording device, and just so we're, uh, you know, just so you know what's going. Of course, you don't have to do anything different or acting different, <laughs> but I, I know you wouldn't anyway. So this is an interview with Thomas Gavan, who was a graduate of the College of Law in the class of 1951, and we are at his home in Shepherdsville, Kentucky. And um, for the first part of the interview, we're just going to be talking, you know, before we start the formal interview, which will be back in the library. But for now, we're just having lunch, and I thought we would just turn on the recording device. So, you, don't, you know, we can just carry on as normal, but I just wanted to at least be capturing some of them. So a minute ago, you were talking about the Scott Street area over in, uh, if you would like this dress, and I don't yeah. know what the difference is between the well, two. Well, that's a poppy seed. Poppies. I don't know what that, that is. That looks it like it be could blue be cheese. blue cheese dressing there. So a minute ago, you were talking about the Scott Let's Street that. area. Here, I'll, let me put the spoon in there. Don't you want any dressing? Oh, I will in a second. I'll probably try the blue cheese dressing. Okay. So you were talking mm. about the Scott Street area that is across the street, basically, across Nicholasville Road from the current law building. And you'd mentioned that you used to sell, uh, you'd, you'd hunt and sell rabbits there. Would you tell that, that again, <laughs> what you would do? Well, we'd, you, we'd have to buy ammunition. So mm -hmm. we, when we went hunting, and so we sold these rabbits as kids to buy ammunition, shotgun and a rifle ammunition. So how old were you when you were doing this? Well, it was over a period of years. We did that for several years. I was probably... Oh, eight or nine, was on, this, on up to maybe junior high school. Okay, so this was when you were a kid living in Lexington, yeah. not when you were in law school. Oh no. Okay. No, no. So when you were a kid, you would you would hunt rabbits, and then go over to the kind of University of Kentucky area, and sell your rabbits to the local the and you said it was the black community yes. that lived across the street. And from the there. market was twenty five cents a rabbit. Mm -hmm. In Lexington at that time, they, they still had down there on uh, the railroad. Yeah, the railroad they had a still market, there. They had a market in there, mm -hmm. selling like open market, selling everything, and they also sold rabbits and hung them up by the leg, mm -hmm. not skinned but gutted, and people would come by there. You see them looking at them, and then they'd buy them. I think they got more than a quarter maybe but that was our market that's how much you charge now would you go hunting with your siblings or did you just I don't have, have any I didn't have any it was usually my father mm -hmm. and when I came back from war he had a beautiful Winchester skeet grade 20 gauge shotgun with two barrels, one full choke and one cylinder bore. It was a pump gun. And we went hunting with that thing and I shot a rabbit and when you wounded one and he's down there wiggling around on the ground, well you'd pick him up by the back legs and just knock his head on the post, kind of putting him out of his misery. Well, when I did that, that rabbit squalled, and I didn't enjoy hunting anymore. After that? Yeah, I, I, I quit hunting. I like guns. I bought a lot of guns after that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you grew up an only child in the Lexington area, is that in right? In the Depression. So, tell me, sort of, if you wouldn't mind telling me kind of when you were born and what your family was like as a childhood in Lexington? Well, my father, had, in our family, there had been doctors and dentists and lawyers scattered back through them. And my father had an uncle in Texas named Freeman. Mm -hmm. He was unmarried. And he wanted to send my father to medical school. He would, his, my, uh, my grandmother was divorced, and uh, so this uncle was going to send him to medical school. And he met my mother 
when they got married, before they got, uh, they dropped out of high school, they didn't graduate from high school. And he got a job as a special delivery boy mm -hmm. at the post office when he was 17 years old, delivering letters on a bicycle. He had to fit about his age, he's supposed to be 18. And he worked in that post office, the only job that he actually had, although he had a lot of side jobs, like Keeneland would hire people at the post office to sell admission tickets or handle the tote machines. Mm -hmm. And they also hired law students. They thought they were honest. And they, they tried to hire people. Mr. Bishop was the head guy at, Bishop, at, uh, at uh, Keeneland at that time, and that his son or grandson might be still running it. Yeah. They still hire some law students to do things like, um, there's some law students who bartend out there and do that sort of stuff. We have a, one student who was, he was more involved with um, Churchill Downs and working, instead of at Keeneland, he worked at Churchill doing some media relations stuff. So we still have ties to the horse industry at the law school, which is nice. Well, they paid $15 a day, which was really a half a day. $15? $15 a day, which was a lot of money mm -hmm. in, in that in 1949-50. So, when Keeneland, uh, when, when the Derby was run, they took all these workers and let them work Derby Day, and they paid you for three days, but you just had to work one real long day, from about 8 o'clock, almost a 12-hour day. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I worked out there in that infield selling $2 tote tickets all day long, and they were out there trossing dwarfs. And really, they were went girls, but you know, that old fashioned with a blanket. And they, I'd see them, a girl going up in the air, coming down, and going up in the air, and drinking all kinds of rowdy and wild stuff going on. So, this was the infield at Churchill Downs. Yeah. That you were working for, you were working the Derby Day in the night, in the early 1950s. Well, Probably 49, too. Mm -hmm. And you were selling, you said you were selling tote tickets. So you, was that a $2 Just bet. a $2 bet ticket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, a bunch of law, law students were doing it, and we'd go out in the same car. Several of my classmates are probably mentioned in this thing that you're bringing, we'd ride in the same car. Mm -hmm. And they would pay you... Three for three dot three days of work for just one so day of work the working derby, out there yeah. at the derby. Yeah, forty five dollars, man. Mm -mm -mm. Of course, I had a GI bill, and then I worked. I worked for the Central Kentucky Mortgage Company while I was in law school. It was a mistake. It took too much time away from my studies. Mm -hmm. But my wife and I didn't want to live in some dump, and so we... Mm -hmm. Now, where was the central uh, Kentucky mortgage offices? It was in a bank building. It had two men, William Ezell and a fellow named Guy, G-U-Y. Mm -hmm. And I was the third man. I was hired to go out to... Frankfurt and Winchester, Danville, those towns around Lexington, and solicit GI loans and farm loans. And they had a deal with lawyers. They were going to do the title that would let me be in their office to interview prospective clients and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I met lawyers in each of those towns and saw kind of what they were doing. Those All these country lawyers were general practitioners. Yeah. And we kind of saw what they were doing, and I didn't realize it, but I, I had a very good learning process there. 
Jim Clay over at Danville. Kind of war horse kind of guy. Pretty good loader. I'd say a good loader. Trying to think of the names of some of these other lawyers in those towns. Mm -hmm. But lots in Frankfurt sold for $600. Building lots. And these GI loans, the maximum loan was $10,000. 4%, 20 years. Then you had to pay. One twelfth of your tax and one twelfth of your insurance into a escrow fund, so they could pay you, take you by the hand, and pay your bills, mm -hmm. and also protect their interest. Mm -hmm. So, when I got down here, I bought an old house and was working on it. So, I went and applied for a maximum GI loan and got it and finished that house and my payments were sixty dollars and sixty cents a month on the principal mm -hmm. plus a twelfth of tax and insurance. So yeah, they added that to the sixty dollars and sixty cents and that kept going up and I kept that loan for the full twenty years. I, I, sold, I built this house out here well, I still owned that one, and, and I had about two or three payments to make. For some reason, I wanted to run that loan out. And when I, the last payment I made the last month was $89 and something. So I had the advantage of having a big house with hot water heat and stuff in it, and lived there 20 years, had three children there. Walk to work, and I don't see people having that advantage now. Yeah. They got all kinds of loans they get, and then they can't pay them when they get out of school. Yeah. But that really, and that that's the story of probably hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah, the I don't. I've been I've been threatening to do some research on that GI bill. I think that's one of the most brilliant legislative acts that's ever come across. Really allowed people to, it really allowed America to build a middle class. Yes. Absolutely. Now we see situations where it is going to be hard for America to continue having a middle class because of the. Um, stratification of income in our country. It's unbelievable. I can't imagine that. Mm -hmm. When I went in the Marine Corps on January the 5th, since I'd had this one... That was 19... Was that 44? 1945. 1945. When I, after I got this one quarter at UK in that football scholarship, they put us on the bus... Well, there were eight of us, mm -hmm. and they, because of my ROTC and my college, they gave me, they put me in charge of the group papers. I don't know if I was in charge of the group, but I was in charge of the papers. And when we got down to Paris Island, we got off the bus, there was a sergeant standing there. And I said, my name's Tommy Cavan. I'm from Lexington, and I'm in charge of these papers, and here they are. He looked at me and said, did I ask you your damn name? I said, no. He said, uh-uh, no's not the answer. It's no, sir. Who puts you in charge of anything? You're nothing. 
Oh, I'm sitting there listening. Man, he tears me down. Mm -hmm. So, of these eight guys, three of them were illiterate, coming out of the mountains and cities or something. Mm -hmm. And we got there, they put them with another group of literates for training. Mm -hmm. And they tried to teach them to read a map and to do a few things on their own. But then they scattered them. I think they had a, I don't know if it was 64 men in the platoon. I know we had two squads. and They had three or four people scattered through there, and the ones that could read kind of, took care of them on things where reading became, read the maps and mm -hmm. now, those guys that couldn't read, they're not, they were not dumb. Some of them were, but they, they were not necessarily just dumb. They could really be smart, really, some of them. But they just didn't ever get to go to school. Yeah, they had a different set of skills. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Those guys from the mountains could take care of themselves, you know. Mm -hmm. Some of the city guys could too, some of them, but you had guys there, small children coming from home, and everything in between, the criminals, mm -hmm. the whole bunch. Hmm. You know, they were letting you, you get caught in a crime, and if you wanted to go to war instead of going to jail, if it wasn't really a serious crime, or if it was, it could be a serious crime, but you were able to do better or something, but they, yeah. that, that was a way out. It's back to You're going out and flee the military, I'm mm -hmm. going to. And when you, was the, at that time in 1945, so you had gone to a semester of college. Quarter. Quarter. A quarter of college. About 90 days, I think. September to December. December. And then you were, at that point, was it pretty much all of your friends were going to go, were enlisting anyway? Or was there something that made you enlist specifically? My 90 day greetings. <laughs> you got a letter from the president yeah. when you turned 18 to, that you had 90 days to get your affairs in order and report to. You were drafted, so you so were. I, you so were, I, I was mm -hmm. drafted, but I volunteered for the Marine Corps. Okay, so was it? Were you drafted, or did you go into the Marine Corps before they no, could draft? No, no, I was drafted. You I had. Drafted. To, I didn't get out of school till December. Mm -hmm. And I, and I went. To, then I did. I went on January the the fifth, and a fellow went with me named John Gorman, who I went to always do school together, whose birthday was in September. Mm -hmm. And we rode that bus down. Man, that when we went down there to get on that bus, yeah, his mother and his sister. Do you need and, to get the phone? Yeah, I need. No, I right. get it. And all that bunch, and then my grandmother, and grandfather, aunt, uncle, cousin. So, man, they're all crying and wailing. It's a very young bus right there at the post office on the corner of Limestone and whatever that street, Bar Street or whatever that is. And Would that have been downtown? Then? Yeah. yeah. The downtown post office. Yeah. Which, that is, that now the, is that now the courthouse area? No, it's, I think it's still on the corner. I mean, it's right near all that court stuff. I don't guess they tore it down. My father worked there. That's, he worked in that old post office on Main Street. And he he held well, everything. I guess they must have torn. I'm trying to, I'll look into it. They must, because it was on Main and Limestone. No, it's all, this was on Bar Bars. and Limestone. It was North Bar. It was North. North, uh, North Limestone and Bar. I'll look at them. They had a 
bar down there in Lexington called Fisher's mm -hmm. on the door. It was painted, a little place for big men, no women allowed. Wow. Bam, right on the door. So my father, just a day or two before I left, he took me down to that bar and we were gonna have a drink. Mm -hmm. So we ordered a drink. <clears throat> and this bartender said, uh, well, how old is that boy? And my father said, well, he's old enough to join the Marine Corps and risk his life. He said, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. So when you, so you got on the bus, went down there, and then your service was well, let right... let me tell you about that bus ride. Yeah. John Gorman wanted to be in the Navy. I wanted to be in the Marine Corps. I was intent on killing Japs now. Jimmy Sharp, my neighbor, killed on Saipan. Mm -hmm. Billy Fugazi, my best friend and a young growing up, was shot through the leg. Both of them are Hendrickley High School people, by the way. Not in my class, they were, one of them was ahead of me, Fugazi, I guess both of them were ahead of half a semester. And then I ended up losing six classmates, not schoolmates, they were in school at some point or other when I was. Yeah. So I had this thing <clears throat> that I thought I was going to do to kill the Japs, to get even. I mean, it's just a mean streak. So I went down to try to buy a rebel flag, a Confederate flag. I envisioned myself taking these islands, and when I did, I was going to run up an American flag. And then I was going to run up a Confederate flag. Well, I bought a small American flag and took it with me. But I couldn't find a rebel flag. And that had no connotation about blacks or prejudice or anything. My family were Southern and Civil War and all that kind of stuff. But my father and mother were, were not racist of any sort. Mm -hmm. and, and it had no, I, I never related that flag to that. Now I'm looking at what's going on and it's just a change in worlds I guess is all it is. So, But I'm just amazed at what I thought I was going to do. You know, but when I found out what was going on the chances of me ever getting to the point where I would uh, be able to run up a flag, anybody's flag if you want to take a beach. <laughs> it was it was kind of, it, it wasn't much chance that was ever going to happen. Very romantic idea of, of what some, you, of, yeah, yeah, very I, romantic idea. I, I guess idea, it yeah. was romantic. I, I didn't know what you'd call it, but it didn't. But, Never got know, the that, opportunity. No, but that, that's the attitude. Now, I had a, mm -hmm. a, a neighbor, boy, and I, he lived up there on Columbia, and I lived on the corner of Woodland and Clifton Avenue. Woodland and what? Woodland and Clifton. Clifton. You know where that library is in Lexington, that big library? Mm -hmm. Well, they came in there and built that on Clifton Pond. That was a pond. Last week, I called a guy named Squat Allen. He really, his name was Ed Allen, but they called him Squat. And he had a tick, he jerk but he was a good athlete. And his father had a store down there on Clifton Avenue in the corner of some street right in front of that pond. And it was a neighborhood store where you walked to buy stuff, meat and everything else. And I was up there in Lexington and saw where he had been in a hospital where he was still living. So and I spent a lot of time and looked up finally found his name and I called and got no answer. But just next week I, I accidentally ran up on his name again and I this in the office I dialed it and his wife answered the phone. We've been married sixty three years. And he and I talked for an hour. He was bigger and older than I was, you know, and he used to absolutely kick my butt in his fo football out on the sand lot, you know. Mm -hmm. We played football there in Clifton Park. 
and he didn't go in the military because of that disability, but he got a basketball scholarship with Rub. And he played ball for the University of Kentucky during that war. And I noticed that he played a lot when he first got on the team and the war was going on, but when these guys started coming back, the competition got him. And he, he didn't get much time or much scoring as he had gotten in the past. Yeah. But we that's not anything to do with the law school. But yeah, it's just, but it's a good, you know, I don't know. It's incidental. Yeah. yeah. If I went down, I walked from that corner, Wooden and Clifton, and now to the east, right across the street on Woodland Avenue was the sheep farm. That's the University of Kentucky Experiment Station. Mm -hmm. That's that same farm on the other side that you saw in this picture with me and my father. And that sheep field was mine. <laughs> we got, you know, we, they'd run us off. Mm -hmm. We'd be over in the barns and there was a pond over there with crawfish and turtles in it and all kinds of stuff. And Ken Thompson and I were just, we owned that place, man. So, and they built, that's where they built Cooperstown in World War II, or at the end of it, for all these veterans to live mm -hmm. when they came home. They had married veterans. They had two bedrooms and three bedrooms, plywood houses, and that's where they lived. I bought eight of them when they tore it down and brought them down here to make rental property. It created a slum. And I couldn't stand it until I tore it down. But, but so you were going to tell me about the bus ride from I Lexington to down. Down. So you had mentioned that you had had the drink with your father at that, at that bar. And so John Gorman had to have the Navy. And he was preaching to me about that. Look, what, you get to sleep in a dry place and three meals a day. And, clean and all and those damn marines are going to get shot and go on this assault stuff and I was telling them about Jimmy Sharp and Fugazi and what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. Well we left each other when we got down there and got, they separated us and got back together that night and he selected for the Navy and I selected for the Marine Corps and he was happy as a lark and I was happy as a lark. So we go off to boot camp, him, he goes to Great Lakes, I go to Paris Island. Then I go to Camp Lejeune for this advanced infantry assault training. And he goes to California and they make a corpsman out of him. So when I got, we, got through at Camp Lejeune, they send you in and let you select what you, what you was going to do, which was a crock. So I asked to be a seagoing Marine. And we went out and there's, and when they called it all out, there's, I think there's 54 men in this platoon. And they had one guy they took as a truck driver, or mechanic, as a truck mechanic, and took me for sea school. And the other sea 50, schools, yeah, sea school. That's that's where a marine's on a ship. Oh, okay, okay. I thought it was like letter C. No, it's S C A sea school, yeah. like where you're out on. Okay, yeah. Again, amphibious assaults and that sort of thing. No, no, no. This this is duty aboard a capital ship, battleships, heavy cruisers, and mm -hmm. aircraft carriers. They have a marine detachment. Mm -hmm. Historically, it was to protect the officers from mutinies by the crew. And our berth is always between the officer's quarters and the crew's quarters from history. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it was on the USS Fall River, which was a new ship I took. It was a plank, what they call I became a plank owner. When you go on a Navy ship for first crew, they, you have the honor of being what they call plank owner. So I got out there to go to that sea school, and he's out there going to this Corman School. So we got together. Boy, he saw me. He said, "You dirty sob." I said, 
what? He said, you don't know, you don't know what they've done to me, and look what they've done to you. He said, they made a damn corpsman out of me, and I'm with the Marine Corps doctoring you bastards. I go ashore on assaults with nothing but a bottle of iodine. I don't even get a pistol. And you, you no good bastard, you are on a Navy ship three meals a day Day. in the dry. (laughs) (laughs) There there ain't no justice in this book. We've laughed about that all the time, but just a flip. Yeah. You know. But if they if they hadn't put me in C school, I would have been a replacement at Okinawa. And these guys I was trained with got shot all to pieces there. And I'm I'm really lucky to I've had luck riding on me. I've beat this game, I think, the game of life altogether. It hadn't been all good up and down. But altogether I've been on top pretty much all the way through. I don't know why. Yeah. It's luck. Of course, a lot of times make, you make your yeah, own yeah, luck some, sure. but yeah. uh, still. I'm going to uh, refill my iced tea. Okay. Now, is there anything, as you can tell, with you doing the talking, I did all the eating here. <laughs> <laughs> I was able to clean my plate really well because it was very good. But I'm going to go get some more iced tea. Is there anything that you'd like me to get you while I'm up? I don't think so. I'm in good shape. All right, I'll be back in a minute. I'm going to try and pour this in the sink and see if that works a little bit better so we don't get it. Okay. All right. I think you got to take the stopper out. I told you when I was walking to school to decide to China to what school I, where I was going, what I was going to study. I lived up there on uh, in walking distance of UK. Yeah. So and, what street did you live on over there? Do you remember? Yeah. My first memories are on West High Street. Okay. About a block from Broadway, east of Broadway or two. Mm-hmm. I lived in one of the oldest houses in Lexington, but nobody paid much attention to it. It was a log cabin that was covered with uh, siding on a very steep lot, and it had a like a walkout kitchen in the base, what might be a half basement or something. And I can remember we had a, I can barely remember, we had a Model T Ford. And it was called Weezer. And it was a coupe. And I would ride around. I rode around with them in that. Was that night? Would that have been 1948 then? Oh no, that would have been about 19. I was born in 1926. Oh, okay, so you're. Ta- I was thinking about when you went back to go to law school. Well, I, oh, I thought you. I was going to tell you where I lived. But oh, that's, we that's lived not growing up. up. Okay, so let's start with that then. Where you lived growing up was this place on East High. On uh, West. On West High Street. There's a, there's a big church across the street, kind of. Mm-hmm. And they've all, of course, a lot of that stuff's been torn mm-hmm. down, and that's the house that I lived in was torn down. And it was a log my, cabin with siding, a little, mm-hmm. yeah. My great-grandfather was named Richardson, and his daughter, my grandmother, always told me that <clears throat> he served in the Civil War. That I think it was a thing somehow that, that there were a lot of, at that time there were still a few, quite a few Civil War veterans mm-hmm. around, so people are, there weren't very many listed men, they was all colonels or something. <laughs> but he was supposed to have been in that war. And I can remember talking to him and 
he'd sit in a rocking chair and look at me and say, Sonny boy, he says, I wonder what you're going to amount to. He's rocking in that chair looking at me. He, he was a, my babysitter, kind of, like they have. Mm -hmm. And I got the first dog, his name was Bobo. And uh, they, they, he was around there. I got measles and scarlet fever at the same time, I can remember. And diphtheria was running around, and we go to a store. My mother heard somebody hoop with that hooping cough in the store. Banshee grabbed me and took me home right now. It was children were getting that and dying. You just didn't. This health thing was a different deal all the way around. People don't think about it really, but a lot of people didn't even never went to a doctor in those days. So we moved then to Woodland Avenue in Clifton. And I lived over in that house several years and played in that sheep field owned by the University of Kentucky. And I ran them crazy. You know, I told you we owned it, and, mm -hmm. <coughs> or we acted like we owned it. And that was with a couple of the neighborhood boys. Yeah, especially Ken Thompson. He lived up on Dixie Court. You probably don't know where that is, but it's on Cumberland, Columbia Avenue, about one, two, two blocks from Clifton. And there was an alley that ran from Woodman down to that street that the store corner that that store was on. And Billy Fugazi lived in a little house off that alley, and. Uh, we were up and down that alley a lot. And they built a sewer system there. And it, 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 our point of entry to it was at Woodland Avenue, right down there at the bottom before you get to Euclid. There's a, yeah. If you go down there, you'll see a big sewer intake, which is big enough that you can stand up and run in. And they built that. I don't know how far east it goes, we didn't go east, we went west. And it came out over at the university where the student union building is. And it had a, it has bars across there now, but that's where we got out. We didn't go west, over west of Limestone was a kind of tough neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And we didn't go over there, but man, we'd run through that sewer. You couldn't walk, cause there was water running down the middle of it. Mm -hmm. But if you ran, you could run on one side, and when you started to slip in, you'd jump over and run on the other side. It was a snake-type movement to get through there. And there was a lot of kids populated that sewer. Yeah. It was, I, I think it maybe was a sanitary sewer and a stormwater sewer. Mm -hmm. And it's probably now all stormwater. But that went down there right under Stall Field. And in high mm -hmm. school, where we played football was on Stall Field. During the war, they practiced out at Cassidy Field or whatever the name of it was out there behind. It's on Rose Street. So you were living there in, then at that point on near Woodland in it was Columbia was the, it was it was uh, Woodland Avenue and Clifton Woodland Clifton Clifton okay and the first time so, that I, anybody died that I knew yeah. My age, you know, my age was this kid that lived down there where the lost, where that library is now, and got up there and had a fire. Where the main library is? Yeah. Or, okay, so right there. It's where he lived on his, see, that was a pond, so this road circled and people lived on both sides around this pond. Yeah. And he got down there and got on fire and killed him in that. So was the house on fire? No, he was down there in Clifton Park, and a, and they had a fire built down there, like a bonfire. Yeah, mm -hmm. and he got in it or flashed out or some way, and it, before they could get it out, he got burned and then died. So they had his funeral, and he was in that he was in that house. They had it in his home, mm -hmm. and and I went down there to that, and all that wailing and you know sadness and stuff. But that's the first death experience that I can remember in life, besides elderly people maybe yeah. dying, relatives or something. 
Damn. But oh, geez, I'm trying to think of as a kid. I didn't really know. I don't know if I knew anyone growing up that I knew who would have died at about my age. It wasn't until I was in my 20s when I had a friend pass away from brain cancer. Well, I had another acquaintance in, in junior high school, a girl. Yeah. In grade grade. And we got out for the summer and we went back to the ninth grade while she was deadly ill with a like what I think now was a brain cancer, and she died. I used to know her name, I don't remember it now. But so, I lived there and went to Jefferson Davis School, mm -hmm. and they, then they changed was, it. Was that to, middle school? Or was no, it was great. Grade school? Grade school. And I met this Don Russell, who was my lifelong friend, and he's still living in South Carolina. What's his name again? Russell. Russell. Donna Laura Russell. And so that was at the that was at the Jefferson Davis Elementary School. And you say did they change the name then? No, no? I they changed the district mm. and I, then I went to Maxwell. Mm. Oh, okay. Which was about two or three blocks north. That was the other school was two or three blocks west, I guess. Mm -hmm. So over on limestone. And then we went when when uh, the junior high school out there on Tate Street Pike was built. Mm -hmm. I can't think of the name of it right now. Cassidy School was out there, kindergarten. Yeah, I it was Morton, it. Morton Junior yeah. High School. And I was in the class of, in the seventh grade, and that was the first class that completed that grade school. Mm -hmm. I could look out the window and watch them build those subdivisions starting to go out to Tate Street Pike. Mm -hmm. They were that close to the school, and they'd dig, they'd dig in basements with a mule and a scraper. And the teacher told me to quit looking out the window and pay attention and I was so more interested in that construction so she punished me, put me in the closet, closed the door, and it had a window in there. <laughs> I just could look at it completely. <laughs> I said I was lucky. <laughs> That's funny. The proof is in the pudding. <laughs> so I have a question that's oh, no, off. This is interesting. Yeah. Am I, Was it uh, Frank Dickey was a teacher at Morton Junior High School when it opened. He wasn't much older than we were. And when we came back from the war, he was going to the university at the same time, but he became president of the University of Kentucky. My social science teacher in junior high school. <laughs> that had a twist on it. And we'd go up there and see him. No. His wife died not long ago. My, I have a question about, and you might not have known much about this or have heard, just because it might have been a little bit earlier than your sort of time, is I just finished reading a book in talking to an author. Her name is Mary Jean Wall, and she was uh, the horse... She was the commonest for racehorsing at the at the Herald Leader for a long time. And she also was affiliated with the history department. She wrote a book about a woman named Belle Breezy. Yeah, the whole prostitute. Yeah, the whole prostitute. <laughs> yeah. Who had a who had a, her sort of brothel. And I guess it was really also a gentleman's club in the sense that she sold a bunch you know, she sold alcohol and it was in essence a bar, the lobby of her and that was over in that part of town that would have been... That was, that was on the north of north Main side. Street. Yeah, north of Main Street. It was about one block north of Main Street, where Rose Street made a T-intersection in those days. Mm -hmm. 
was, it was, out, it, and it was east, I think it was east of that, but still north of Main Street. Now, officially, her brothel was closed down in World War One, I, I think, or was it World War Two? I can't. Remember. I'd have to look at that again. Well, because it was, it was going when I was going to school. So, when you were going, to so yeah, we used to go over and ride by and see it had a red light in it. We'd go by there. I don't know how many times we've driven by that place. When you Ken were Thompson's sc- brother. No, wait, when you a, were in school, when what? I was in. I graduated from Henry Clay in nineteen. So in high school. Well, maybe before that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no. And so we never did stop or go in or anything, but it was kind of a. So you out riding around at night, you know, you'd go by there and see what was going on. So did you ever see her out in the community? No. No. But I had a I had a an algebra teacher in Henry Clay named Nettie B. Foster. She was an old time teacher. She was a boy sat on one side of the room, a girl sat on the other, and if they crossed her leg around, she had a stick or a ruler or a yard stick and wham. She'd get it lay it on you, you know. So yeah. She owned rental property. And she, after we got out of high school, she got charged her too much to maintain it, so she got up on the roof and fixing the roof. And, it, and the horse lived in this house. And she ran the those prostitutes, and they were still dealing with bell breeding. And she fell off the roof and broke her hip. Oh gosh! I think it's after she retired from Henry Clay that mm-hmm. she was really a good teacher. But you, and so she also allowed these women to sort of make their money and do their livelihood in her rental property. No, I don't. I think they went to Breezings. They went to work at Breezings. Oh, they would, but then they came home to live. Where well, she had, I, I, I didn't see that, but that, that's, yeah. my, that's what I presume mm-hmm. was happening. And I don't think she was running any, yeah. letting any commercial business go in there. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine the school teacher now getting caught running, <laughs> running a thing like that? <laughs> God, you'd never hear the end of it. Henry Clay had a a good school. It's funny. Just before I came down here at Shepherdsville, they had a principal. But he couldn't make it down here. He didn't know what the heck he was doing. So they fired him. And he ends up up in Lexington in Fayette County as principal of Henry Clay High School. So while this is going on, the school board in Indiana or Illinois decided that they wanted to build a high school. And as it progressed, they decided they wanted to build the best high school in America. Native civic pride, you know. Well, they looked around and nobody knew what the best high school in the United States was. So Northwestern and some other college undertook a study to discover the best high school in the United States. And they finally figured out the best way to do it was to contact all the colleges and have them review their records and see which schools consistently provided them with the best students. I think that was the core plan. Well, they got 50 schools schools in America that on this list of the best high schools in the United States. Two of them were in Kentucky. One of them was Eastern in Louisville, and the other one was Henry Clay. So this guy that we ran out of Bullock County just before I got here as a no good, he, he was able to have, maintain a high school that was one of the best in 50, the 50 in America. Yeah. And then Joe Hall was basketball coach down here where he started. Well, what did he know about basketball? He sure didn't know whose son ought to play. 
and they ended up running him off before it was over. I don't think he likes to tell the tale about being run, run off, but I mean, it's, it's really rich to me. So he knocks around a little bit and he, he went to school at Swanee with John and, uh, uh, not only was with them, but John and Lisa are graduates of Swanee and they had a connection with him some way that, that way. So he coaches here and coaches there and all at once he's Rupp's assistant. I think he played for Rupp ahead of time. And he played also at Swanee. But, so Rupp picks him as his successor and so all at once he's basketball coach at UK and he, he can field a national champion but he wasn't good enough for Bully Cannon. <laughs> and he, yeah. he, he, he brought his team down here when uh, Casey was playing. I don't know if you remember Kyle Casey. He was a championship basketball player. Probably a little bit before my time. And that era. When he came I was up, born in 78, so I would have been... And he was coach in that time period, so it would have been when I was a little kid. But he <clears throat> he brought his team down here to play in a, in a gym at Shepherdsville. They were doing that kind of bit, trying to integrate more with Kentucky population as a whole. I don't well, know. I don't know if the economic. I don't know if the if the, the educational side of it was in on that. I think they tried to reach out, but they haven't. They hadn't done much with that. Going maybe lately they're doing something, but they weren't reaching out too good to all these country places, rural counties. So we decided that we'd have the basketball team up here for a dinner when they got through, which they did. They filled this place up. They had a, we had more seats and hell, they was all over the place. And so I said, well, who do you want to, I mean, invite? He thought a while, and so he, this one fellow, he said, well, that's who I want, he and his wife. Just one couple. Of course, he had a lot of bad feelings about this. Mm -hmm. And this guy was, his, he fished with him. His name was Shaw, he and his wife. She was a school teacher, and they said, she sat right there and he sat there and I think Joe was sitting here. But Shaw's wife was there and in that chair and Shaw was sitting at that one. And they had a wonderful time. And he even had the team out there in the garage. We had tables and all set up everywhere. Well, we had to get the sheriffs out here. I could have sold tickets easy, a hundred dollars a plate. To, to, and that never dawned on me to come in here. All these people were crazy. They wanted in here bad, you know. So it, he he came back in the, with a total triumph in over, overcoming this group that kind of shunned him and treated him badly. It's a very good thing of what goes around comes around to me. That was a that was a perfect example of that working. <clears throat> yeah. And the mayor down here turns out to be a scallywag, but he did name a street Joe B. Hall downtown here. It's on 2nd Street, running right in front of the local library. The local library is now on Joe B. Hall <laughs> and the railroad. Mm -hmm. That is funny. <laughs> My goodness. Well, I'm ruining you. I'm sitting here talking and enjoying you listening to me. No, I'm. This is <laughs> what I'm here to do. This is this is the project. So. Well, you don't want anything else to eat. We got that dessert coming. Well, I'm fine for right now. Okay. I'm good on. I'm good on. This was very nice. This was a very nice little salad that was put together. A lot of different stuff on it. You said your 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 daughter mm -hmm. that made it and yeah. Lisa. No, Lisa's the judge. Oh, Lisa's the judge. Yeah, she's down there working. So who is your other daughter? It's Ellen. Ellen? Yeah, Ellen Foster Govan. And does she live does she live here too? Yeah. She's never been married. Huh. She's been asked a number of times. 
to tell me she can't find one that measures up to me and is screwing everything up. And I didn't think, you know, but I think that happens sometimes. But these kids are probably overestimating daddy. You know. So Ellen is Ellen has lived here, and then yeah, Ellen is that is that is that the, so? It's you and Ellen that live in this home now? in this house, and then John and Lisa are at her, over there. Over where? On the other side of that library. Oh, so there's you're see that's what I thought. There was an attached you're home. Living, there are apartments over there if you want to call it that. So it's an apartment. I'm Christian, their son's room is upstairs. So it is. This is quite the family compound. Then. Yeah. So it's you and Ellen in this part of the house, and then over on the other side of the library, Lisa and her husband is. They're there, and then a John uh, Christian Gavan Spainar, their son, my grandson, has a room up there. Up there. He's married, and he got his doctorate uh, at the University of South Carolina Medical School, Charleston. Yeah. In microbioinformatics, he married a lawyer, and he's living down in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. But he's got his room here with stuff in it. Mm -hmm. My son's got his room here with stuff in it. Lisa's mm -hmm. room over here still got stuff in it. We got an empty guest room, mm -hmm. and Ellen's got her room. Yeah. And then I got my room, and over there, their bedroom joins the. Library. My bedroom upstairs joins the library, mm -mm -mm. and they got one. And the upstairs Christian's bedroom joins the library upstairs. Two of us can get out on that balcony ba oh, area and <clears throat> come down. And so of there's a lot of books. Well, when, when now that looks like that portion was built more recently. It was. So when it, so this was built in the nineteen seventy. Nineteen seventy is when you put this home in. And then this one was built. The, it the took extension. a long time. I made a lot of mistakes over there. What do you think your biggest mistake was? Building it myself. Uh, the, the extension was built mm -hmm. yourself? Okay, so that was your big mistake. Is yeah, I, I needed more supervision that could uh, better coordinate the trades and finish something. Mm -hmm. I thought I was saving money. And then I liked it. I did a lot of work on it myself. The labor work, I didn't have much skill. Mm -hmm. Mixing concrete. And, and so when was that? When did you? When did that start? When did the extension start? I don't know when it started, but it ended about 10 years ago. It probably took me four or five years to finish it. Mm -hmm. So it ended in around 2005 is when it was sort of finished. Well, yeah, maybe it looks it looks wonderful. I mean, it looks well. It is, I think. Yeah, I think it looks great over there. I mean, the library connection is a great. Looks really good. But John Dumas' son designed that library. Mm -hmm. Dumas designed the house, but I think he designed that library. Mm -hmm. I've never seen one like it, so I don't know if they copied it somewhere or not. But I like it. Yeah. But I used to. In high school, I'd go in the library and they had, on the on the table. They had a big dictionary, Webster dictionary, about a foot thick or eight inches, th you know. Not and bridge, it, and yeah. it had all those pictures in it. And I just read that live that dictionary. I don't know why, but I, I was interested in the dictionary. I can remember at Maxwell grade school in the fifth grade, they had a, one of those classrooms made a library out of it. I'd go over there and peruse that library, and the first book I can remember reading was uh, Swiss Family Robinson. I'm going around there perusing it, and I saw that, and they had a jungle scene or something that made me take it out and look at it. And I read that. When I was very young over there on in that home on Clifton Avenue, 
And my father was always, they were trying to teach me to read. <clears throat> and he'd read Tarzan books. And I'd listen. And so he'd skip a paragraph and I'd catch it. Tickled him to death. <laughs> you know, I almost knew what was coming when he was reading it over and over and over again. And he'd laugh about that. Yeah. So, we, so you grew up in a home that had books. Yeah. So your did your was your and your father was a postman. Well, he was, but he he held every job in that post office from special yeah. delivery boy on a bicycle to general foreman. Mm-hmm. And when he died, he died at age fifty-four, mm-hmm. cigarette smoking with cancer and all that. Man, it's bad. But he had held every job in that post office and. He was had about sixty or seventy men working under him, and five of them were college graduates. And he said the five caused him more trouble than all the rest of them put together. That the college graduates thought they had something coming because of their degrees, and that they were better than other people because of their degrees, and they were looking down on the people and trying to tell him what to do, and uh, difficult to take orders. And, and it, he, it, it caused him a lot of trouble when he was 45 to 54, mm-hmm. dealing with these. Yeah. So, now, so, a lot of people came to work down there after World War II, and he had a lot of veterans working for him. Then on Christmas, when the mails were heavy, they, all that stuff came shipped by rail when you sent packages in those days. There wasn't much trucking business doing it. And they go down there and unload these mail bags that were full of parcel post. And he would hire all of my friends from high school to work. And we'd work at night mostly. And you'd work 12 or 15 hours a day on the clock. They got on us because nobody checked out for lunch. But we, you know, we would work when the train came in. They'd be come in at all times. And of course, they were coal-fired trains, and the soot and stuff was on these mail bags, and you had to wear a handkerchief over your nose. And by the end of the night, it was this black, where you were breathing this dust coming off of those bags. And it, so that was in that would have been in your high school friends. So yeah, we were in high school, and high school then we came then. back in college too. That, now, when did you come back from the war? Or I from, got, from I got, service. I, I got discharged August the twenty fifth of nineteen forty six, and just barely got back in time to get in the UK. That first semester, and of course, it was full. So, of, so it was from January home. of nineteen forty five to August of nineteen forty six was yeah. your service. Yeah. And we, I was in my ship was uh, turned out to be the flagship for the target fleet. At Bikini, it was atom bomb tests. And you see this stuff on the screen with the atom bombs going off and these ships all in a circle. That was the pattern of the target fleet that was anchored as targets for those two atom bombs tests. Mm-hmm. They'd had goats on the outside, dogs, horses, everything, pigs on these ships and all kinds of military equipment and dropped one bomb under, it went off underwater and then one went off overhead. And we were the closest ship to those explosions as a flagship and they turned the ship into the, to the target area. And you couldn't see it because it's over the horizon. Now if you got way up high, you might have been able to see some of the mast or something on those ships. But the Marine detachment, they had us come out and get on that deck and, and formation. And, you know, we were at ease, and then they got ready for a countdown. <clears throat> so they made us sit down, turn our backs on the target, cover our eyes, and they had this countdown. Ten, nine, eight, doing that, and when it got down, zero was all clear. We jumped up to look. Well, then you could hear the. Then you heard it. 
it took that sound a little while to come, it's 10 miles or whatever it was. And then you, you could see that plume coming up out of there, that mushroom. And when that, they were lining up, I looked up and these officers up on the bridge, <clears throat> they all started getting ready for this thing. And all at once, the bridge is cleared and all this armor that comes down over windows, you know, when you're in a fight, they cover all the windows and everything. They let, they let all that down, and here's these officers going in this covered thing, and here we are out on the deck. And I'm saying, what's, what's going on here? <laughs> you know, it, yeah. But it all worked out. Some of those guys on that ship, the ship became radioactive. That happened in July and August. Those what was the name of the ship again? USS Fall River. Fall River. CA, Which I guess it was out of Fall River, Massachusetts. Yeah, CA-131. Yeah. The bow of that ship is up there now in a, that park, mm -hmm. that ship a museum area. And the Marines were battle stationed, some of them, on 20 mil, twin 20 millimeter anti-aircraft cannons. They had two of them right there on the bow, but they didn't get them. They cut the bow off too short, but right... 10 feet from where those anchors are was these two pods where these Marines were, but my station was amidships. I was a gunner on a twin 20 millimeter cannon. The Marines manned the 20 millimeters as their battle stations on the ship. When I went ashore, I had carried a BAR, rounding automatic rifle. So when you were you were in this sort of this target grouping that kind of watched the atomic tests or were in charge of the atomic yeah, tests. Yeah, we were the flagship. You were the, the flagship of the, the atomic admiral, test group. The admiral that was on our ship that was in charge of it. And so then were you all, when the bombs were actually dropped, were you all the closest U.S. ships at that time? Yeah. Yeah. So how close to Japan were you all? Well, I don't know. The bikini, we were on the bikini, bikini. at that toll. That's the, yes, they told it. Yeah. All right. Hmm. Yeah, we went ashore. You, where, did you all? Was your ship engaged in in, na in naval battles while you were in service? No. 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 Well, that's really lucky. Fortunate. Yeah, you were saying earlier that you sort of have ridden luck for a long time. Mm -mm -mm. But I think I got more good out of that than they got out of me. I, when I got off that bus and gave that sergeant those papers, and he got all over me, we went to a warehouse. The customers and everything getting over there. And they issued a sea bag and then some clothes. And everything they gave you, they'd hit you in the belly with it, you know, boom. Not 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 that way, but just boom. Mm -hmm. Just a rough touch, and you put that all in a sea bag. Well, some of these guys, you know, they really weren't very strong. So they were. They were it turned out there was about fifty-four or sixty or something all together said now we're gonna go to our barracks follow me and this guy starts off at a dead run well I just took that sea bag and threw it over my shoulder and I'm right behind him he said follow me and keep up that's what he said well I was right there on his heels and about halfway across this was a huge parade ground about halfway across, I looked back, and my God, these guys were straggling everywhere and dragging some of them, dragging the sea bags, try, trying to get across there. Well, I was right on his butt because of it, I was in such good shape in that football at UK. And he couldn't, he couldn't outrun me in distance. He probably could have outrun me in speed. I wasn't that fast, but stamina, and I'm right on his case. 
So when he gets over there and turns around, right there I am, there's nobody within 150 yards of us. Well, that ticked him off and it marked me. And so later on, just a few days, the, the, we were falling out and he said, anybody here had any military training? How about our OTC? I put my hand up. Oh, an educated eight ball. You're just what we need. Now come up here, I'm gonna show you where you are. So they put me on the corner of the second platoon, they lined you up by height, kind of. And he said, now you're to keep two paces behind this platoon. Wherever we march, whatever we do, we're, we're counting off of you, and you better be two paces. And I'm going to be watching it, and it's going to be your ass if you're, if you're two feet or two paces and one inch off. So it was my job to... to keep up but not ahead just right there and boy every day they found that I wasn't doing it and I was right there on that corner easy to get to these other guys on the left and in the back they, they didn't get anything you know they were they weren't there in the front now damn they dealt that on me all the time mm -hmm. Mm -mm -mm. but it turned out I think that might have been good I, I had to learn to take that pressure and keep your mouth shut yeah. And, uh, but that training was pretty good. They had a 55 gallon hot water heater for us to take a shower with in January. And about three guys got a hot shower. Maybe three got lukewarm, and the rest of us got the hot <laughs> cold. Yeah. And I got this bronchitis or something. I used to get lung congestion with and cough up phlegm, green stuff. They, you know, they didn't have penicillin and stuff at that yeah, time. So it was like you were infected. Or how, yeah. And I spent three days with a real sore throat in, the, in their hospital and I almost got thrown into another platoon, you know, of course I was losing it. And now you don't want to do that if you keep from it. But, yeah. I got through all that. My grandmother came down there to visit me. She had a daughter in Florida. And so she gets on a Greyhound bus. She must have been 60. She gets on a Greyhound bus by herself with a bag in her hand going down to Florida. Well, she, she detours over to Paris Island. That bus comes up there. I think Yamasee or something is a little town there at the gate. And so she's starting to get off. And the driver, she said, he's, the bus driver said, Madam, well, you can't get off here. She says, oh, I come to see my grandson, Sonny Gavan. He's from up at Lexington. He's down here going to be a Marine. <laughs> he says, but that's a Marine base, Madam. You can't get in there. Oh, but my grandson's in there. Well, they won't let you in. Well, I'm going to see. He said, well, the next bus comes by. You're about five hours, and you haven't got a very good place to be. I just thought I'd tell you. And she said, oh, I'll be, I'll be all right. So she goes over there, and that's what they're telling me later. I wasn't there, you know. She mm -hmm. goes over there, and he starts off with this guard. He said, you can't come in here. Oh, my, my grandson, Sonny Gavan, he's from Lexington. He's down here going to be a Marine. He said, I come down here to see him. Well, you can't get in here. Well, I got to get in here. I'm here to see my grandson. They call the corporal of the guard, same thing. Sergeant of the guard, same thing. Finally, they get a major down there. And so finally, he puts her in a Jeep and brings her in there to a bench at a bus stop near a PX. I'm out in the bivouac in, under pup tents. Somebody comes over and snarls. Or is this Gavan? Or Given or something. They didn't call it right. They, they, come, with, come with me. And I said, well, where are we going? He says, my God. I said, come with me. I, you'll find out when you get there. So I got in the, in the Jeep and got, went over there. And, and there's Granny sitting on the damn bench at the PX. 
Well, hello, Sonny boy. And so we sat down there and talked about a half hour. And she said, uh, I'd like an ice cream. I said, how about going and getting us an ice cream cone? Here's a, a dime. I think there was a nickel apiece or something. So I took the dime and went up there and got two ice creams. And when I came back, she was gone. She got on a bus. She didn't want to say goodbye to me. Just, what's that got to do with UK? Nothing. I just, I but I know it doesn't. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, she just couldn't say goodbye to her grandson. No. Yeah. No, of course, that war was raging then, you know, in the Pacific. Yeah. My mother and father went to the Kentucky Theater in Lexington in February of 1945. Iwo Jima by a Marine assault that occurred. <clears throat> At Path A News had photographs of stuff. And they were at that invasion and taking pictures of these Marines in the surf that were dead and the surf was rolling their bodies up on the beach and the water went out and it rolled down. And she saw that and my dad said she jumped up in that theater and squalled, my baby, my baby. And he had to pick her up kicking and carried her out of that theater back to the car. She was really shocked by that. Mm -hmm. That's just some of the civilian side to all that stuff. So During the, that depression... When the war started, you were in high school, right? No, or I was in middle of No, I was in... I was early on, maybe in junior high school. Junior high school. My father and I had been rabbit hunting Sunday, December the 7th, down Tate Street Pike at Clay's, that's not Clay's Fair, it's, but they, don't have, they didn't have a bridge down there now. I guess they still don't have one, I don't know. But we were down there on this side of the river hunting, colder than blue bases. We got in this old, he had this 37 Dodge. We got in that and were going, coming home, and he turned. We turned the radio on, and that's when we found that Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. And of course, he never gave a thought that I would be in it. <clears throat> and he was uh, in his late thirties, or, or I guess, and a little bit too old. He had to register for the draft, but they, he was married with a child, and he, he was in a classification that they didn't take him yet. Mm -hmm. And he missed World War II just a little bit. He was born in 1901. And uh, so that war got over before he was ready to get in it. And so he missed World War I, and then, then he, he was World a little War too old for World War II. But he yeah. said to me when <clears throat> in 1931, Roosevelt was running against Hoover, I think, for president. And this depression was really bringing down. And he had this job, he got paid every week, we had a car. <clears throat> I had, had ice, didn't have a, had an ice box. We, we had an ice box, we didn't have a refrigerator yet. <clears throat> And he said, I want to show you something, and I don't want you to forget it. And he took me down on Short Street where the jail, the old jail in Lexington was. And that had a, that building had a vestibule that was open. It had a circular arch, and it was open, and the door to the inside door to the jail was about 15 or 20 feet inside this vestibule. And they'd set up a soup kitchen inside it was kind of drizzling and wet and cold and they set this soup kitchen up and they were serving a cup of coffee and uh, bean soup and cornbread and there was a line a guy that i didn't see a woman in it that went from that jail two blocks down in the rail breezing territory and turned left i don't know how far it was to the left <clears throat> and I, there was not a smile on that face. It was the most depressed. They, their, their body language was total depression and hopelessness. 
and they were smoking these whole roll your own cigarettes and they had some of them had on these caps not like baseball caps but those old caps yeah some of them had on Homburgs and good suits that were thread bare and all of the heels run down some of them in overalls but all the clothes was all wore out they were wore out but not a woman in it and so he told me that he had never seen the times like that in this country and he didn't know what was going to happen but that we were going to be he said we we're going to be for Roosevelt because he think we think he's for the working man and Hoover has not been favorable to, uh, to the working class so we're going to be for Roosevelt and hope he wins. But don't you forget this. Well, I never did forget it. And Roosevelt won. And so I watched that thing develop from the time, that, you know, when he started putting the NRA and the CCC and trying to pack the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. All that was going on while I was growing up, but little, but I was kind of growing up. And my father kind of followed that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, this, you know, this war started in 39. I was born in 26. So, <clears throat> I, I don't know, I guess I was in junior high school. I said, I can remember about a, these Germans die bombing Poland mm -hmm. and these Russians all at once journey, turning on Russia, knife in the back deal. But still never thought that I'd be in it. And then we got along there. But most people wanted in it. They didn't, they wanted to, the country was really unified. They knew that there, really our back was to the wall. If you ever got, if, if they ever got over here and took it over. But when I look at it now, I didn't realize how small Europe is. I guess you get over there and you, you can go from, from uh, Holland to Germany, you know, and, and all that fighting was slowing it down, but my gosh, in a day's time, you can drive all over that place. They get over here and think they're gonna take this country. How many men is it gonna to take to occupy this country? You couldn't do it unless you had a bunch of Quislings. I saw this thing on television here last week where these Japanese were sending these bombs with balloons. I saw that too. Did you see that? Well, I, I, I didn't see the television. I heard a radio report about it, about how one of them actually landed in in Washington State. It hurt, it hurt some school they children. killed them. Yeah, killed, yeah. But that I, yeah, I mean, there was... The geography of the United States allows us certain geopolitical advantages, such as, you know, really impossible to invade, pretty much. After I was, this group that I grew up with, there were five guys, two of them are dead now, <clears throat> and their wives, our wives, and we, they get set up a place, and every year we go have a long weekend, mm -hmm. every year. And they went, we went to Pike's Peak one time. And I got on that train, that little, that, that, that train was level, you know, but it went up with the gear on it or a cable or something. It was too steep for the wheels to turn. It had pulled it up. Got up on top of Pike's Peak and found out that uh, that song was uh, America the Beautiful. It was that was written by a school teacher. The words, and she had been up on Pike's Peak and seen that view, and she wrote those words. I don't know if it was put to a song already written or somebody wrote the music to that later. But I went out on that o open space up there, and boy, it was cold. The wind was blowing, and it was ice and snow and stuff around there, but it was really cold. And I, I, the sun was out bright, and I looked out over that area that they were looking when she wrote that song, and 
thought about that uh, waving green and all that. And that's the most patriotic, inducing thing that you could do. Mm -hmm. That was that really got to me. Yeah. Well, do you want to take a break for a minute? I would like to use the gentleman's room. Oh, we then, can't have. I don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm going to clear the clear plates, and then maybe we can move to the library. Well, that's not your ice cream. Well, if you're having some, I'll have a little cup. Well, if you don't, if you're not ready for it, maybe we'll eat it later. Well, let's maybe let's do it later. Okay, so you've got some cookies and stuff. Yeah, I'm going to just run to the gentleman's room. Go and do we'll, it. We'll move to the library. I've been a kind person to 